Now that we have given our confirmation rules, we can extend this to Bayesian updating. Bayesian updating is the idea that we can always update our probability judgments based on the evidence we gather. Here, when I'm talking about updating, I mean that we update our antecedent judgment about what some hypothesis predicts. For theism, the same rule applies. From our last video, we derived this rule, the probability of E conditional on TNA1 is greater than the probability of E conditional on TNA2. So as long as we get no violation of the ultimate goodness principle, and as long as we can satisfy the axiological relevance thesis, then we can always update our theory. Updating works in the following way. First is that we recognize that all predictions of scientific confirmation require auxiliary assumptions. This is known as confirmational holism within the philosophy of science. While I have explained this in a previous video, here's how it works. Using an example, I want to test the hypothesis. H copper conducts electricity. By using a copper wire to connect a light bulb to an outlet, I must make sure that many things are correctly in place. For example, A1, my copper wire is sufficiently pure. A2, there is electricity in the building. A3, the light bulb is working properly. A4, the wire is properly connected to the wall and the light bulb, etc. The expected result is, of course, E, the light bulb turns on. The logical form of the experiment is this. If H and A, 1 and A, 2 and A, 3 and A, 4, then E, which reads, if H and A, 1 and A, 2 and A, 3 and A, 4 are true, then E would happen. Now before we go on, a brief recap of logic, if P then Q not Q, therefore not P. This means that in a conditional statement, the negation of the consequent entails the negation of the antecedent. So in our example, what if the light bulb doesn't turn on? In other words, what if the expected result E in our example doesn't happen? Then we would conclude that not H and A1 and A2 and A3 and A4. Recall that when a conjunction is false, it doesn't mean that all of the conjuncts are false, but that at least one of them must be. So let's say you try out your experiment and the light bulb doesn't turn on. Have you proven that copper doesn't conduct electricity? Not necessarily. Most likely one of the other assumptions went wrong. You would probably start blaming the connections, and if you see that they are properly in place, you will blame the light bulb, or perhaps you will conclude that the wire wasn't pure copper, but had some contamination. The point is that you wouldn't be a bad scientist if you do that. Scientists do that all the time. Scientific hypotheses are never tested in isolation. When a prediction is true, you have confirmed the hypothesis and all the auxiliary assumptions. But when a prediction fails, the only thing you can conclude is that something went wrong. It could have been the main hypothesis, yes, but it could also have been one or more of the auxiliary assumptions. Consider the case of Newton's gravitational theory. Due to gravitational attraction, in 1821, Alexis Bouvard predicted that the orbit of the Uranus, known at the time as the planet that was farther away from the Sun in the solar system, would be such and such, but observations consistently showed that the actual trajectory deviated from this prediction. No serious scientist thought that a well-confirmed theory such as Newton's should be immediately rejected because of a failed prediction. Rather, many revised some of the auxiliary assumptions, including the one about Uranus actually being the planet farthest away from the Sun. Two scientists working independently, Adams and Leverrier, posited that there must be another planet whose position and mass was affecting Uranus's trajectory. They calculated where this planet was supposed to be and how massive would it be. Eventually, the planet Neptune was discovered by direct observation. The solar neutrino problem also illustrates this point. Neutrinos are near massless microparticles which are only subject to weak forces, they only interact with protons, and can go through almost any massive object. Our sun emits a vast number of neutrinos from its core, and the analysis of this flux of neutrinos is the main way of studying the inner workings of the sun. In the 60s, given what they knew at the time regarding the sun and neutrinos, scientists predicted a given number of neutrinos coming from the sun but experiments showed only about a third of this number. This discrepancy was known as the solar neutrino problem. The tested hypothesis was the standard solar model, and the auxiliary hypotheses included knowledge concerning the nature of neutrinos, the instruments that measured the solar neutrino flux, which include washing up liquid, assumptions concerning the whole experimental setup, etc. Scientists didn't just reject the standard solar model in the face of this discrepancy, after all, the standard solar model was well confirmed by many other situations and experiments, but analyzed some of these other assumptions. 
They hypothesized that perhaps neutrinos were more complex than they initially thought, and that there may be more kinds of neutrinos, some of which were undetectable by the measuring devices used in the initial experiment. This hypothesis was confirmed in 1985. Did Adams, Leverrier, and the scientists involved in the solar neutrino problem proceeded in an unscientific manner by not dropping their theories immediately? Surely they didn't. So there must be something wrong with Popper's falsifiability criterion. It is true that if a theory consistently fails to be confirmed, then that would be a good indication that it should be abandoned, but that would take us away from Popper's criterion. After all, how many disconfirmations would one need in order to reject a theory? That would of course depend on each particular situation, but we see now that, contrary to Popper's suggestion, falsifiability by itself is not enough to reject or accept a theory. Because of these factors, the same rule applies to theism. We can always update our axiological expectations on theism as long as they follow the confirmation rules. I will go more into specifics in later videos such as the problem of evil the problem of divine hiddenness and other anti-theistic arguments since this has massive implications for all of a posteriori arguments against theism. But here I want to focus mainly on how theistic prediction work, and then we can get to how we update. Here let's have theism be our main hypothesis. Theism. There is an omnipotence power who governs creation and change on the basis of normative goodness. Let's have the following be our auxiliary assumptions. A1. Goodness is diffusive of itself. A2. Plenitude principle. Goodness can be instantiated in a plenitude of things. First is the diffusiveness principle, by which goodness is necessarily diffusive of itself. According to the diffusiveness principle, goodness requires something other than itself as a manifestation of itself. Hence, a good being will inevitably bring about other good things. Second would be the plenitude principle. We can say that God brought about things into existence in order to communicate his goodness to creatures and to representatives' goodness through them, so God's goodness or God's nature is reflected in creation. However, God's goodness cannot be adequately represented by any one creature or any one thing in creation, but rather God would create many diverse creatures and many diverse good things. That way, whatever was lacking in one's representation of the divine goodness may be supplied by another. For the goodness that exists in a simple and uniform way within God, it exists in a multiplicity of ways within creation. Hence, creation as a whole participates in and represents God's goodness in a more perfect way than any single creature or thing does. So if we combine the diffusiveness and plenitude principles, we get a sort of goodness principle by which goodness requires a variety of other good things to fully manifest itself. This means that God will ground all of the entities that can successfully manifest his goodness fully. Here we combine theism with these auxiliary assumptions, and we get the following conclusion. There is a probability of one that God will create a diversity of good things. This is simply entailed from the fact that theism contains within its hypothesis that God will always do a best action where there is one, a very good action, and no bad actions. Thus, any time that we can join theism with auxiliary assumptions about value and filter it through our confirmation rules from earlier, then we will always increase the probability of theism. Thus, we have TA1A2 entail E, which is the evidence for the diversity of goodness. Thus, the diversity of goodness confirms theism and our auxiliary hypotheses. Now, what about if we make the wrong auxiliary assumptions? In this case, we can always update. Let's compare to disjunctive hypotheses. Let's have it be T and A, 1 versus T and A2. Here T is exactly the same, but we have different assumptions. Let's have A1 be the auxiliary hypothesis that God must always prevent suffering at all cost. Let's have A2 be the auxiliary hypothesis that God must ensure that evils be both compensated for and defeated. In other words, that evils must entail some positive state of affairs. Here we can see that if we conjoin theism with the first auxiliary assumption, then the evils we see would disconfirm the conjunctive hypotheses. But in this case, it is not the fault of the theory. It is the fault of the auxiliary assumption about what God's obligations are. If we, however, switch our auxiliary to A2, which is that evils must be defeated, then logically, if God exists, then there is a probability of one that God would not only create an afterlife so that creatures who never defeat evil can do so, but that all evils are intrinsically defeatable. And we must also find evils being defeated in this world as to give some evidence for the conjunctive hypotheses. And thus, even if we learn that T and A1 is false, that doesn't give us reason to lower our credibility in T and A2 because it is the fault of the auxiliary, not the fault of theism directly.
In a previous video, I've already given criteria on what would count as evidence against theism directly. One must show either a violation of the ultimate goodness principle, or show that there is actually axiological irrelevance. In other words, one must show that there cannot be a plausible axiology that can be conjoined with theism to predict the data. Since theism cannot make predictions on its own, then any evidence against theism must be filtered through the rules we laid out. One cannot just footstomp and claim that they have found evidence against theism when it has not passed the filters. Let's take another example of theistic updating. Let's say that we have theism be our main hypothesis, and let's say we have two different auxiliaries. A1, human moral characters are highly flawed and often deficient, and therefore humans have low value compared to what value they could otherwise have. A2, human moral agents are infinitely valuable. One could argue that it is highly implausible that humans would exist on theism, given that humans are inferior to the other types of creatures that God could have made. And so one could antecedently expect that God would have made us much better off. Since God is omnipotent, then he could have created beings that are far more impressive than us. In fact, the philosopher Mark Walker has used this line of argument against the theistic hypothesis. It is the anthropic argument against theism. However, Walker's argument relies on an auxiliary axiological assumption about the value of humans, which is, of course, is highly controversial. In contrast, Joshua Rasmussen has argued that people could be very valuable, even infinitely valuable. They even use a Bayesian argument of their own to independently confirm their auxiliary. Now, of course, one doesn't have to confirm their auxiliary before one makes predictions. It is not necessary that the auxiliary hypotheses are known before. Typically, they do require a conjunction with the main theory, but not always. And so we see that if we conjoin theism with the auxiliary hypothesis that humans are infinitely valuable, then there is a probability of one that God would create humans. And since we clearly do see humans in this world, then once we update our axiological assumptions about humans, then humans predictively confirm theism. It is the auxiliary axiological hypotheses that is being updated, not theism itself. Any axiology that describes values and follows the confirmation rules won't do any damage to theism's probability, given that theism logically overlaps with axiology. So as long as we find axiological relevance in the state of affairs of the world, then we can always update our auxiliary assumptions. Thus, the evidence actually confirms or disconfirms complex conjunctions that include various auxiliary hypotheses. Confirmational holism reveals itself as a precondition for successful evidence collection, and thus must be used properly to update our conjunctive hypotheses in light of the data we find in the world. Thus, scientific hypotheses can be conjoined with any number of auxiliary assumptions to make any predictions it wants. The scientific theories that we accept, however, are those that make predictions that match with the world. Thus, scientific discovery is itself a process of updating auxiliary assumptions and the same logic of updating applies to theism. This, of course, is only the first way of updating. The second way to update is to update our background knowledge relative to new evidence. Consider a previous example about Newton's theory. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, astronomers observed that the orbit of Uranus differed from the orbit predicted by Newtonian mechanics, Given that Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus are the only planets in the solar system. Since there was at that time no independent evidence for the existence of an eighth planet, it is plausible that these observations lowered the probability of Newtonian mechanics and were thus evidence against it. Nevertheless, in the mid 19th century, astronomers discovered Neptune in precisely the location needed to explain Uranus's orbit on Newtonian mechanics. Relative to this new knowledge, the probability that Uranus had its observed orbit given Newtonian mechanics was near one, and so relative to this new knowledge, the above observations provide strong evidence for Newton's theory. Let any be Newtonian mechanics, O the observed orbit of Uranus, K the initial knowledge of scientists, and D the discovery of Neptune. Plausibly, the probability n conditional on O and K is less than the probability n conditional on K and probability of n conditional on O and D and K is greater than the probability of n conditional on D and K. It follows that O is evidence against n relative to K, but evidence for n relative to D and K. This is a way of updating our background knowledge, and our background knowledge plays an influence on our new conditionals. Let's use the problem of evil as an example. Replace Newtonian mechanics with theism, then replace O with evil, but then replace K with background evidence, and replace D with saint-making. So plausibly, the probability of T conditional on O and K 
is less than the probability of t conditional on k in the sense that the observation of evil is evidence against theism. But then we discover saint making and thus we update to the probability of t conditional on o and s and k is greater than the probability of t conditional on s and k. So it follows that evil is evidence against theism relative to the initial background knowledge, our background knowledge prior to discovering saint making. But evil becomes evidence for theism relative to saint making and background knowledge. So in other words, when we update our k variable to k prime, we generate new conditional probabilities. And since on explanationism, all probabilities are conditional, then we can update our basic probabilities through this updating method. Of course, updating in this discoverability sense requires that we discover new values about the world to generate a confirmation. We cannot simply just update our auxiliaries. But here, just like in the case of Newtonian mechanics, we can allow theism to not only retain its initial probability, but also gain more probability conditional on newly discovered evidence. So the two methods of theistic updating based on our experience of the world is one. We update our auxiliary assumptions conditional on some evidence. Here we apply this updating rule. The probability of E conditional on T and A1 is greater than the probability of E conditional on T and A2 too. We update our background evidence to include new evidence in it so that we can in fact predict the observation. Here we apply this updating rule. The probability of T conditional on O and K is less than the probability of T conditional on K prior to some newly discovered value. But once a new value, or V for short, has been discovered, we update so that the probability of T conditional on O and V and K is greater than the probability of T conditional on V and K. In both these cases, we are learning new conditional probabilities, and thus, through the process of discoverability, we are allowing theism to update based on the evidence we find in the world. In the second method, our newly discovered evidence may well be a theodicy lurking in the background and so screen off the initial disconfirmation, especially if we find some new data, such as saint-making, which gives a probable reason for a theodical story. In conclusion, these are the two ways we can learn what theism predicts. Either we change our auxiliary hypotheses about value and so screen off disconfirmation, or we discover new evidence which, when conjoined with the background evidence, will actually end up positively confirming theism. And in either case, however, as long as we follow our meta-principles, the confirmation rules and the updating rules, we can always learn new conditional probabilities and thus update and increase theism's probability. Conditional on the state of affairs that we observe in the world. Hello, this is Christian Idealism, and thank you for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. You just finished watching my video on uh, theistic updating and how we can update based on the evidence we find in the world. And so now that I have my entire methodology laid out, I hope you can all be aware of what exactly my case for theism is going to look like. I think methodology is the most important thing, so now that we have that set up, my next videos on this subject are going to be my case for theism directly, so getting into the actual evidence we find in the world. So, I hope you all keep a look about that. But, thanks for watching my videos. If you have any questions in the comments about any of the concepts I went over, please feel free to ask, or don't hesitate to ask. So, thank you, and have a nice day.